Hello, this is 1.1 1 .1, uh, Introduction to Chemistry Part 2. So the third topic is chemistry is a central science and if I put a FYI, you do not have to draw this figure down. This is just for your information. So what do I mean by chemistry is a central science? It is connected to all the other sciences. Um, so the study of chemistry is important at is, as it is central to the sci all the science fields and because anything about you and your life and everything around you is made up of atoms and to understand how um, molecules and big things made out of atoms work, you need to understand chemistry. So, um, for example, if you go to the doctor, you are dealing with medicine and medicine is uh, created with biochemistry and molecular biology. And to understand that, you have to understand chemistry. And you can look at all of these and see how everything is connected to chemistry. So all you have to write down is the topic and the part at the bottom in red. The other part is an infographic for you to understand. So next thing, we have to learn about matter is made out of atoms so let's see what is the basic structure of an atom and below i have given you the description i have made an infographic of it for you to understand easily so matter is made up of atoms atoms have two sections two portions of uh, regions you have the nucleus in the center and the electron cloud which is much bigger than the nucleus around it so Nuclear reactions occur inside the nucle nucleus and we will be learning it in unit four, uh, 14 or 11, the last one. For the duration of our time, we will be talking about electrons and the electron cloud. They are the ones who are responsible for chemical reactions. So the electron cloud is made out of electrons. We use the E minus one symbol and they have hardly any mass, but they have a charge of minus one per electron. And then the nucleus is made out of two subatomic particles. They are protons and neutrons. Neutrons mean neutral, they have no charge because each neutron is made out of a positively charged proton and an electron. Plus one and minus one come together to give you a zero slash neutral charge. Protons have a plus one charge. These two guys combined together are the ones who give the mass of an atom and the mass of an object collectively when you take all the protons and neutrons making up all the atoms in a substance. And so the total charge of any atom is zero because the proton number uh, is an, uh, is equal to the electron number always in a neutral atom. You have to remember that, okay? So scientists found out all the different elements that we could find and organized them in a periodic table based on repeating patterns for us to easily study them. We will be learning about that too. This is for honor students only. So um, let's look at how all the elements came to be. So according to what we know, hydrogen and helium were this, are the smallest elements and hydrogen was the first to be created by the Big Bang um, when the universe was formed and then two hydrogen atoms would fuse together, come together and make helium which has a mass of two. Hydrogen has a mass of one and every other element until iron, which has a atomic number or number of protons equal to 56, they were made by fusions of hydrogen and helium together inside the center or the nucleus of stars. So um, any young star ends up using hydrogen as its fuel and creating helium that causes the nuclear reaction that provides energy for the solar systems. And then as the star gets older, 
they stop being able to fuse things because there's no more helium and uh, hydrogen left and then the star dies so this process of combining smaller atoms together nuclei together and making bigger ones is called nucleosynthesis when an atom is uh, sorry when a star is about to die it explodes and forms a supernova the other elements heavier than uh, 56 uh, higher than iron fe are made in supernovas Um, so topic five, basic versus applied research. Research can be divided into two types based on the purpose. Applied research is to find a solution for a practical application. How, for example, uh, somebody discovered a bioluminescent glowing in the dark green jellyfish. So then they identified the protein that causes this green fluorescence and the person who identified the green fluorescent protein was just a regular basic research scientist he was just curious why is this phenomenon happening he wasn't trying to use it to help humanity or something like that so when you do research just for the curiosity of finding how something works that is called basic research now in the next slide i will show you some examples of this you don't need to memorize them so let's say somebody discovered this bioluminescent protein it's called green fluorescent protein or gfp for short he goes and asks how can we use this bioluminescent protein from jellyfish to use in uh, cancer research or alzheimer's research or some kind of research to mark diseased cells and that would be an example of applied research so basic and applied research talk to each other they are not segregated they work together so this is for your i explained to you this phenomenon and you can check it out these are yeasts um, a worm containing the green fluorescent protein is it's tagged with another protein it's attached to another protein using genetic engineering this is a fruit fly or drosophila having some kind of a protein um, connected to gfp and this is a bunny is keratin protein in the skin and hair is attached to gfp same thing with these mice and look at the brown mice they don't have gfp so you can make a glow in the dark human too i mean that's not ethical if you want to see further you can copy this link and check it out anyway now major topic scientific method what is that it is a systemic systematic and logical approach to answer a scientific question there are four key steps this is going to be a part of your lab reports too first thing is an observation a direct observation of a natural phenomena or obtained through reading other people's research that is already published also known as peer-reviewed research articles then you make a hypothesis it is an explanation that is testable to explain why something is happening it is not a guess then you do design and carry out controlled experiments i'll talk about controls later you collect and analyze data to determine if the hypothesis is true or false data you collect can be quantitative or qualitative and then you make a final conclusion based on analyzing your data that will tell you if your hypothesis is true or false finally you communicate your results if you're a scientist by publishing your results in a peer-reviewed journal that means other scientists in your field will read your research and how you did your experiments and see if it merits publication if you did a crappy job generating your data then they will reject your paper if you did a good job they will accept it they might ask you to do edits then you do them and submit it again 
So now let's look at how this works in the grand scheme of things. Scientific method in action. So first you ask a question, that is your observation. Then you design an hypothesis that is testable based on your observation. You test the hypothesis with experiments. You collect data and analyze them and form a conclusion. You can go two ways, right? You can be proving your hypothesis true or false. So let's see you said it's correct. Then you can publish your research and normally people stop here but say some it's something groundbreaking then others over the years will test your um, ex, do your experiments in slightly different ways maybe add things to and still your uh, hypothesis true and then many years later it is it graduates into a theory a theory can undergo slight modifications but it's still essentially the same. And then if it still stands the test of time and other people ex accept it, most of them, like 90%, then it graduates into the scientific law status. So for example, Newton's laws of uh, physics have, they are indisputable for large objects. It's scientific fact. So. A scientific law is a summary of many observed results and experiments of that theory over time. So please remember this. I would like you to draw all of this. So next, let's see what happens if your hypothesis is wrong. Then you go back and you develop a new hypothesis. And then you test that and you go through this avenue until you find something that shows your hypothesis is correct. Okay. So let's see. Here's an example. You find your toaster is not working. Then you ask, why won't my toaster toast? Is the toaster broken? Is the power outlet broken? Those can happen, right? If the plug in the toast then you think if I plug the toaster into a different outlet then it will toast the bread. So then you plug the toaster into a different outlet and try again. Then you find out my bread toasts or you find out my bread won't toast. So which of these are hypotheses, experiments and so on and so forth. So what about this? Now pause this video and figure out what is what. This is an observation. These are questions. This is a hypothesis because it is testable. This is the experiment and these are your results and conclusions. So if in this case your hypothesis is true, in this case your hypothesis is false. And if it's false, you um, test some other hypothesis. Um, this is um, testable versus untestable claims. So, for example, a question about somebody's opinion cannot be trusted. A question about a natural phenomena, like the one we were talking about earlier with the toaster or the GFP, is testable. So, I need you to know the differences. So, let's see an example. For example, could taxing industrial and automobile carbon dioxide emissions um, greatly reduce global warming. That's one thing. And what about this phrase? Does industrial and automobile carbon dioxide emissions cause global warming? Which one is testable? Pause the video and imagine. One is a claim, one is a testable thing. This can be tested in a lab. This we cannot test in the lab because taxing is not something you can test how people cho make choices based on taxation. I hope that is clear to you. So this is our last topic. How do we um, set up experiments? So experiments have test types of variables, things that can change, types of samples, and types of data you can collect. So types of variables are twofold. You have the independent variable, 
it's kept the same in all the samples and the independent variable is plotted on the x-axis so take this graph you're trying to figure out how the distance traveled by some object time is the thing you can't change so it is the independent variable it goes in the x-axis the dependent variable is the thing you are testing in your experimental samples it's plotted always on the y-axis like this of the graph and often scientists draw graphs of their data to make it easier for them to understand then when you have samples you have two types controls and experimental samples the control is the untreated baseline sample and it there could be a positive and a negative control experimental samples are subjected to the dependent variable we talked about here types of data you have two types as we discussed quantitative they are talking about quantities that you can measure with units for example the length 2.5 meters the mass 27.03 grams the volume is 2.4 liters are examples qualitative is like describing things involving characteristics that cannot be measured or counted for example a metal you can talk about its shininess or luster the smell of somebody's perfume or the gas produced the color how hot or cold it is rather than measuring the temperature with the thermometer color you can measure with um, a um, phot spectrophotometer smell i don't know luster you can measure the light given off but you can do it with your eyeballs also so this is all i have for this lesson so here is a review of all the things we talked Earlier we talked about the definition of chemistry and the five branches of chemistry. Today we learned that chemistry is a central science because it links all the other sciences together. All the things we study are made out of atoms and it is essential to know how they behave with chemistry. We learned about atomic structure, three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons and electrons. Two regions in an atom, nucleus is where you get protons and neutrons who make up the mass of an atom. And then outside the nucleus you get this large area called an electron clouds where electrons hang out. And they are the lightest subatomic particle. We do not count them um, when we talk about the mass of an atom because they are so small. It is the protons and neutrons that give the mass of atoms and substances. For honor students, we discussed origins of elements, how elements are born inside stars or supernovae. Um, then we discussed the two major types of research, basic and applied. Applied is done to fix a problem. Basic is done just to understand why something is happening. We talked about the scientific method, how it's a systematic process to answer a question, a scientific question. We talked about uh, the parts of the scientific method in detail. You should be able to explain uh, when I give you, like in the toaster example, something. What is a hypothesis? What is a conclusion? What is an experiment? What are results? And so on and so forth. Then we talked about testable and untestable claims. We talked about setting up an experiment, variables, graphing them, controls, experiments, uh, types of samples, qualitative and quantitative data. Um, please write all these notes down and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.